One, and we move to our item C, the status of labor negotiations with APD and EMS. Uh, speakers are Lee Crawford from the City of Austin Law Department, Ken Cassidy from the APA, Selena Xi from the Austin EMS Association, and Chris Harris from the Austin Justice Coalition. I don't think, come on forward, please. Thanks. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners. My name is Lee Crawford. I'm uh, working the city attorney's office, and I'm here today. I've been asked to provide a short briefing to the commission on how the city conducts its labor negotiations with the associations that represent our public safety employees. And I will say that I, I think the commission's request for this briefing is really spot on in terms of timing because as you know, we are currently in negotiations with the, um, uh, the EMS Employees Association and we'll be beginning our negotiations with the Police Employees Association next week. I think we have the uh, negotiations with our um, uh, Fire Employees uh, Association starting in April of this year. Could you go ahead and put us to the next slide, please? My purpose this afternoon is, is essentially to provide you with a background and kind of a framework for kind of the legal environment in which the city conducts its labor negotiations uh, with our employee associations, which might be kind of a helpful uh, piece of background for the commission members who haven't been through one of these negotiating cycles in the past. And I would start here with the kind of the fundamental proposition in Texas state law that uh, local, local government employers like the city of Austin are in general prohibited from entering into labor contracts uh, with associations or unions that represent the municipal employees. Now the important thing to understand is that there are a couple of exceptions to that general rule, but for instance that's why one of the reasons why we probably don't see any labor contract with, for instance, the AFSCME union, even though a number of city employees are members of that organization. But there are specific exceptions in state law that do allow the city to have labor contracts and labor negotiations with employees for our public safety groups. We have two different types of labor negotiations and labor bargaining that the city participates in. One is called meet and confer bargaining, and we engage in that type of bargaining with our sworn police and EMS employees. Uh, there's the other type is called collective bargaining, and I'll unpack these very, very briefly for you. Meet and confer bargaining is a, uh, is a, a process that's permitted by a particular part of the state civil service law. So this is specifically authorized in state law. And meet and confer bargaining, the core idea there is that it is, it is entirely a consensual process, by which I mean to say that neither the association nor the city is required to bargain at all. Uh, neither party is required to make any specific proposal on any given term. Neither party is required to agree to anything. So it's entirely consensual how the parties come together to bargain in a meet and confer context. But as I say, the, uh, the city uh, has the authorization under that part of the civil service statute to engage in that kind of labor contract negotiation with the associations for our police and EMS employees. A core idea here too with this type of meet and confer bargaining is that by agreement, the association and the city can actually vary or supersede certain provisions in our state civil service laws, particularly the ones that cover hiring, promotions, some types of compensation, and the disciplinary process. And then there are some miscellaneous provisions as well. But the core idea is that although the city, without a labor contract, would be required to comply strictly with the state civil service law, through our meet and confer labor contracts, the parties are able to modify those provisions in the state civil service statute. The other type of bargaining that the city does, and I'll touch on this just briefly because we don't have fire coming up for a few months now, is collective bargaining. And by contrast to meet and confer, collective bargaining takes place under a separate part of state law. It's the state collective bargaining statute and the local government code. The core difference is that in uh, collective bargaining, there is an affirmative duty obligation of each of the parties to bargain collectively in good faith over essentially wages, hours, and working conditions, and to reduce any agreement that the parties do reach uh, to um, a written contract. 
The state collective bargaining statute, unlike the meet and confer statute, also provides kind of a dispute resolution provision so that if the, uh, the parties are unable to reach an agreement in a collective bargaining context like we have with our firefighters association, the statute provides some remedies including mediation, uh, arbitration, and, actually, and ultimately a judicial uh, imposition of uh, uh, employment terms in that fire contract setting. I will say the parties, city and the, and the AFA, have never gotten to that point. We've always been successful in reaching a contract up until now. Similar, though, to the meet and confer statute, under the collective bargaining statute, the association and the city are also able to vary some of those provisions in the state civil service law on hiring, promotion, compensation, and disciplinary practices, which the parties historically have done in our contracts to, uh, to kind of smooth out how those processes work and make them fit better for our city culture. So that's a little primer on the two types of bargaining that the, the city engages in. And, and what you'll see and what you've probably observed already is that as a practical matter, the city's bargaining processes have historically been the same, whether you're talking about meet and confer or you're talking about uh, collective bargaining. We typically prepare for and conduct the bargaining the same, regardless of what type of bargaining it is. Now, as I mentioned, you know, the contracts are all up for negotiation this year. All three of our current labor contracts are set to expire at the end of September of this year. Um, and so as in, 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 typical, in our typical fashion, the parties are already preparing for or actually engaged in the case of EMS uh, in contract negotiations. So typically we'll have the new contract finished uh, and ratified and approved before the current contract expires. Uh, and I put up here on the slide just some, uh, some language about how the, if the parties don't reach agreement by the time the current contract expires, there are provisions in the agreements that allow uh, the contract to extend for a period of time while there's bargaining going on. The primary difference being in the case of uh, the police contract, uh, the, the contract sort of extends automatically. And in the case of the, uh, the EMS contract uh, and the fire contracts, uh, those require kind of a joint agreement of the parties at the bargaining table. So, Austin, if you could move me to the next slide then. Are we seeing it on the screen? We were there. I know we were there. I thought I saw it. There, there it is. is. That's it. So, yeah, if you could move me. There we go. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. So uh, this slide just basically kind of walks us through what the steps are in the, in the bargaining process. And, and I'm not really here to talk about the bargaining proposals that might be under negotiation now with EMS or might be coming up with police or fire. I really want to make sure that the, the commission has an understanding of kind of how the process works overall. And as you can see from the slide, it's, you know, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, the, the contract bargaining typically takes a good while to accomplish uh, soup to nuts. And I'd like to just make some observations about the sequential steps that you see here on the slide. The first is that um, the part of the public negotiating sessions that you see where you have the, uh, the association's negotiating team and the city's negotiating team sitting down across from one another at a table and discussing wages, hours, and terms and conditions of employment, that's really like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of work that goes on by both the associations and of course the members of the association and the city manager's team and, uh, and the, uh, the, our public safety department leadership um, to try to pull together the bargaining proposals and determine you know, what's the best direction to take those negotiations. So that's why typically we start uh, at the time that we get uh, notice from the association that, uh, that there's a desire for bargaining, which is usually more than six months prior to the expiration of the current agreement. And then as I say, that preparation for bargaining steps, that really, really takes a lot of time and a lot of effort on the parts of a lot of people. Um, uh, another word about the bargaining sessions themselves, we don't do this every time, but oftentimes, you know, if we haven't done it in a few bargaining cycles or we have a number of new members of a negotiating team for either the city's team or the association's bargaining team, 
We'll engage in, in some collaborative work on the front end of that bargaining process. It's sometimes called uh, kind of interest-based bargaining that helps kind of uh, form both sides in the, in the negotiation into kind of a single team designed to really kind of address the problems, to be able to art articulate what the problems are from that side's perspective and look for some common ground to try to resolve them. And then maybe the final point that I'd make about the bargaining process itself is that while the, the teams at the bargaining table are empowered to make an agreement, that agreement that they make is on a tentative basis. And typically the, what they'll do is they'll go through sort of term by term or article by article. And, uh, and if they can come to an agreement on what they want the wording for that article to be, uh, they'll what they call TA it or say that we have, we've reached temporary agreement on that term. They'll set it aside. They'll go to the next uh, topic of bargaining. And at the end of the day, if there's an agreement, uh, what we'll have is a, a whole pile of tentative agreements on individual articles. But that's not the contract, because under the law, both for collective bargaining and for meet and confer bargaining, it's the association itself through a vote of its members and the city council as the governing body for the city that actually give effect to and breathe life into the contract. So once the contract is, is a, uh, agreed to at the table on a tentative basis, then the association will put the, the contract proposal to a vote of its members, and then the city council will take up the, the contract and vote on it up or down. It's not a kind of a line item veto situation, but you, you vote on the entire contract as approved by the, the bargaining teams. And once it's approved by the, the membership through a vote of the members and also by the city council as the governing body, then it becomes effective. And that, in summary, is kind of how the negotiation process itself works. Um, I don't know that there's a lot more I can say about it, but if you have any questions or comments, I'm, I'm, I'm here and happy to address them. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Crawford. Um, if we can minimize the screen, so uh, the PowerPoint, so we can see who's online. And I'll step back, but I'll be here if you need me. Great. Thank you. Um, any questions for Mr. Crawford before we um, take in any other presentations? Mm, okay. I think we're good. Thank you very much. You bet. Do we have all of our other speakers available? I think they're all there. Fantastic. Um, Commissioner Weber, as you were, I think you were the, yes, you and Bernhardt were the key on this. Uh, who would you like to speak first? How, how do you want to, how do you want to take it? Um, we would just love to hear from the associations and what they're, uh, asking for and I, you know, if if they're allowed to tell us, uh, you know, what their goals are. Uh, Selena, I see you on camera first. Do you, you can go ahead and go. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, I just wanted to um, use this opportunity to give you all a brief update on where we are in bargaining. Um, we started bargaining no December first. Um, so we've been bargaining for a, a month and a half now. Um, we hope to wrap up by the middle of February. Um, the police association is starting in February and then the fire association will start um, in a few months. And so it keeps um, the plate relatively light for um, labor relations office. As far as we're concerned, we've basically finished um, our contract currently has 25 articles. We don't anticipating adding any um, articles and we have for the most part agreement on 18 of those articles and so so far we've covered things like discipline um, drug testing um, and uh, association dues and all sorts of other things and so we've basically finished wrapping up everything the last thing that we have left is wages um, so our total benefits and wages package and then also looking at hiring um, and promotions and all of those issues are kind of wrapped up together um, this week because um, we recognize and the city recognizes that the need is so great um, because we're short 120 staff members out of a possible 600 so we're 20 percent short um, because Omicron has decimated um, our medics and we see that we cannot even run all the ambulances that we're supposed to um, that the city has agreed to do interest-based bargaining specifically on some of our overtime concerns and also on wages and so that's what we'll be doing this week 
and hopefully we'll be able to come to an agreement in the next few weeks on the rest of the on everything else. Thank you very much. Any questions for Selena? Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Weber. So I guess like what's been reported in the Austin Monitor, I think is that y'all made a presentation asking for uh, a different wage package and that was rejected. So I'm interested to hear about how it's like back on the table. And also if you could, will you please tell us um, what it was you asked for that the city rejected? Yeah, so in our wage proposal, we really wanted our medics to start at $27 an hour. Um, we see that the city of Austin is currently paying other EMTs $25 an hour to work at the isolation facilities. Um, if you do a basic EMT search in Austin, you can easily see that hospitals are hiring EMTs because nurses are making so much money doing these travel contracts. Um, and so a lot of nurses have left bedside. Um, and so they've actually started hiring paramedics. St. David's is hiring paramedics. Seton is going to start hiring paramedics again um, and, and EMT basics. And so, um, you know, we're, we really are asking for um, something that is commensurate with the Austin market for paramedics. Um, and that's a, a big increase from 1937, which is where our um, paramedics start right now. Um, and that is really, really hard to live on. I mean, I can't tell you the number of messages that I've received um, in the last couple of months. You know, one medic told me that he's been um, busting his butt for the last year and he didn't even clear 60,000 and he has multiple kids that he has to help take care of. Um, and that's working um, his overtime, you know, an extra 24 hour shift um, every other week or so. And so it is just becoming impossible for our medics to afford to continue working for us. Um, we also see in a lot of different fields in healthcare um, and in labor similar to EMS, we just see those wages rising dramatically and our department will not be able to keep up. Um, in our current class um, of, of medics, we have, I believe, 13. We wanted to get a class of 30. Um, so we can't even fill these spots at the wages that we're offering. Um, in our next class, it starts in March. Um, we want 30 and it's 22 people. Um, and so you heard from the fire department earlier. I mean, they have hundreds and hundreds of qualified people that are willing to work for the fire department and we can't even fill a class of 30. Um, and that's happened twice now. And so we just know that we cannot keep up with the number of people that are leaving um, Austin Travis County EMS with the wages where they are. Um, and so we are asking for a dramatic increase. I mean, if you want to look at it one way, we are asking for parity with police and fire for their annual salaries. I mean, they make dramatically more over 10 years. You can make a hundred thousand dollars more being a police officer or a firefighter. Um, and so we're trying to get anywhere close to what the market is for a paramedic in Austin. Um, and basically what happened is the city, um, just told us that the proposal was too expensive. They did not provide us how they got to that calculation. Um, and so we don't actually know if it includes, what all it includes, honestly. Um, and traditionally in bargaining, we provide a proposal and then they provide a counter proposal. Um, and we have not seen any counter proposal from them. We've just heard no from them. Um, so, you know, we're, we're just mostly waiting to see a counter proposal from the city. Thank you. Um, in the interest of making sure everyone has adequate time, I'm going to move over to Ken Cassidy from uh, the APA. And Selena, if you wouldn't mind, just stay and put just in case we have any questions for you at the end. Thank you. Sure. Ken, can you go? Can you hear me? There you hey. go. Hello, commissioners. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, on the uh, labor front, uh, as far as being able to provide staffing, we're over uh, 200 officers short right now. Um, we uh, are about to graduate an academy that started out with, uh, I believe, over 100 officers or cadets. And I believe right now we're sitting at around 70 uh, graduating. So even though we had a, um, a, a reimagined class and working with Kroll and working with uh, Dr. Cringen, uh, one of the big criticisms had been that we were losing too many officers. Well, now that we're under the new process, we've lost just as many. So those are some challenges that we have going forward. 
Uh, a lot of them had to do with COVID and, and medical type issues. But, uh, you know, we have a class starting in March, late March, that should have 100 in it, but it looks right now from what we're hearing, it'll probably just have between 60 and 70 people instead of 100. Uh, we're also trying to hire a modified class uh, with 50 officers from around the state that are already police officers where they can come in and do a, a shorter version of the police academy. So that's kind of where we're at with staffing. Uh, I continually uh, work myself uh, downtown and in other areas of town, uh, backfilling patrol. At, uh, it's not uncommon to show up to work overtime on a 10 person shift and I'd be the third or fourth person on the shift. Uh, and uh, we're, we're uh, not meeting our minimum staffing uh, about 90% of the time. Uh, as far as bargaining goes, we start out in a few weeks. Um, I will not be participating. I've, I've been on uh, seven teams since I've been uh, uh, in the department and with the association. Uh, uh, with upon uh, Tank, a lot of you know Tank, uh, uh, Melanie Rodriguez and Joe Swan and Thomas Villarreal will be leading the team. Uh, I've stepped aside uh, uh, with all the issues that we had with the last contract. I felt like it was best that I not participate uh, in this contract and let the younger officers take over. Um, their uh, big concerns right now are, are, of course, the short staffing. Um, and yes, uh, Selena touched on it. We are paid at a higher level uh, than the paramedics, uh, but I can tell you that uh, uh, even with what we're being paid, uh, a lot of our officers are, are struggling in the younger ranks uh, to be able to afford to live in Austin. So that is an issue. And then, of course, uh, uh, the Office of Police Oversight and uh, uh, the uh, a monitor's office uh, will be always, always as a hot button issue. Um, and uh, from what I'm hearing from the city side, I know they're possibly looking at taking uh, the contract, I'm sorry, the uh, Office of Police Oversight out of the contract. Um, you know, that brings a whole new set of, of issues that we need to discuss. But, uh, you know, we've never been shy of, of talking about it. We're willing to, to listen to what the city and, and uh, a lot of the activists have to say that are involved in this process. Uh, so we're, we're coming into it with an open mind and uh, hopefully, hopefully we can come to some type of an agreement uh, by the end of the year, or at least uh, by March of 2023. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Any questions, commissioners, for Mr. Cassidy? Uh, Commissioner Bernhardt, go ahead. Um, thank you for that, Mr. Cassidy. Um, what would it mean to take the Office of Police Monitoring out of the contract? You know, there, I, do, I think that's to be seen. I mean, I, I hate to give you that answer, but, um, you know, the city attorneys, I think, believe uh, the Office of Police Oversight can function in a certain way outside of the contract. Uh, our attorneys uh, don't believe that. Uh, there was going to be a, a lawsuit. There actually was a lawsuit over the issue when we fell out of contract. Uh, and we actually won at the first level uh, in Travis County uh, District Court, and it was sent to the appeals court. But in between that time, uh, we were able to come up with a, a successor agreement, so we dropped that lawsuit. So um, no one really knows because it's never been challenged before. Um, you have uh, Houston and Dallas that have oversight out of the contract, but they don't have any of the capabilities that our Office of Police Oversight does. And when I say that, uh, they don't participate in investigations. Um, the OPOs in every uh, interview that our I, uh, I detectives uh, do, um, that's uh, unheard of in any other city. Uh, I know Chris Harris would probably tell you something different, but uh, our contract is far superior to anyone in the state of Texas. And uh, the oversight is minimal in these other departments. And uh, we're proud of our contract. We're proud of the work we've done over the years, working with the NAACP and Nelson Linder, and then actually working with Chris and, and Chaz on the last contract. I know that they felt like that was a, a, a huge success. Um, you know, they traveled the country and, and touted um, how they changed our contract for the better, which I agree they did. Um, some of the stuff that was said, you know, I don't necessarily agree with, but uh, I know they saw great improvement in it. 
And uh, I think it's just it's to be seen uh, what this looks like. I know Lee Crawford and his attorneys uh, would probably give a different opinion than my attorneys. Uh, so we're just going to have to have to find out what that looks like. Thanks very much. Commissioner Weber, go ahead. I was wondering, um, Box, if you could tell us about the recent grievance that y'all won um, and how that might affect your position in bargaining. Sure. Um, you know, it uh, it got us back, uh, Commissioner, to where um, I thought we had bargained for and what the officers and the chief thought they had bargained for. Um, there were certain issues that we were having um, that involved um, basically investigative practices being done by the Office of Police Oversight. Uh, they felt like they had the capability to do the things that they were doing. We didn't. We brought these issues to the city manager what, probably more than two years ago, and it took that long uh, to get in front of a, an arbitrator. Um, several people from the chief's office, internal affairs, um, myself, Thomas Villarreal, my vice president, Uh, the arbitrator, Devin Desai, who was the office or the uh, police monitor at one time, testified on what they felt like they had bargained for. Uh, and the arbitrator ended up, uh, you know, ruling um, on every issue that we brought up and, and in, our, in our favor. Uh, so there are lots of changes going on right now at Internal Affairs on rewriting policies uh, that Chief Gay, Chief Manley, uh, had placed into effect, and now those are being reversed. Um, I think, um, to be quite honest with you, um, we had uh, someone in high-level management at APD that was uh, just trying to satisfy and not make uh, the Office of Police Oversight angry and maybe allowed some things that probably shouldn't have been, and, and I think that's how we got to where we went. And you know, now we have Chief Jacone and we have Chief of Staff uh, Robin Henderson that uh, – you know, hold us to task and they uh, demand excellence, but they will also demand excellence and demand that FARA and the Office of Police Oversight function in a way they uh, were agreed to, uh, to operate. So it's, uh, you know, I think it will help out. It kind of gave a clear line of demarcation on where we're at and the city knows what they need and, and we know where, where we're at. But uh, if you had to ask me today, I still feel like it needs to be in the, in the contract. But uh, that is totally up to the city council and, and to uh, uh, city manager Cronk on where they want to go. Uh, but uh, I think uh, Mr. Crawford or Devin Desai could probably offer you uh, a little bit more insight into that agreement and also to the ruling of the arbitrator. Um, uh, Devin is uh, very experienced. He's an attorney. Uh, and he can give you his version of what he thinks that means, uh, but in no way can I put words in his mouth, and I wouldn't want to do that. Any other questions? Great. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy. If you can hold on for a minute on the line just in case there's any questions as we wrap up. Thank you very much. And our last speaker is Chris Harris. Mr. Harris, are you there? I sure am. Hi. Hi there. Good to see you again. Long time to see. <laughs> yes, it's been a minute. It's good to see you too. Um, well, I want to thank you all so much for having me. Um, it's, firstly, I'll just say a little bit of background I think is really useful. Uh, and I'm here primarily and solely to speak as it relates to um, then the upcoming negotiations with the Austin Police Association and not the other um, um, public safety associations. Um, so basically state law uh, forms the backbone of, uh, in, uh, of what goes on uh, as it relates to um, the agreement. It, it really creates the floor uh, for, um, for what's bargained for. Um, and because of really police association uh, capture of our state legislature, um, as you might expect, uh, it's a really low floor uh, when, in terms of the issues that our organization cares about in terms of accountability, transparency, and oversight. And, and what the meet and confer agreement allows is it allows the city 
uh, any city, uh, including the city of Boston, to supersede that state law uh, to, to basically to, to, to not follow it uh, in the instance that there is an agreement between uh, the city and the, the relevant or, uh, association. And so the dynamic that plays out with these negotiations is, is a quite simple one. And it, and it can be seen most directly in the very first contract that was agreed to back in 2001, which is that ultimately it comes down to a bargain between um, uh, uh, for oversight, accountability, transparency, the things that the community wants on this side in order to uh, hopefully deter and prevent uh, uh, police misconduct and brutality. Um, and money on the other side, right? So uh, what we had in 2001, the initial agreement, the very first agreement between the Austin Police Association and the city was the introduction of uh, some of the oversight uh, that we uh, still have some lineages of today. Uh, it did not exist before. And what came along with it was the, maybe the most substantial raise the police association has ever seen uh, in, any, in, in any sort of agreement uh, before or since. Uh, I believe it was around $40 million. So, uh, what happens is the city asks for things that help make sure that this, the department is better. And in exchange, the association asks for more money where they can accept those things. So that's the dynamic at play and, and the ground in which we walk when we try to, to influence uh, these negotiations, uh, particularly in it from, a, from a perspective that's not uh, focused entirely on the actual pay and benefits of officers. So. Um, so it's a very fraught uh, from our perspective, um, but nonetheless, I'll, I'll go over some of the primary things that we see as continuing to be problematic. Um, and I will say that, you know, obviously we had, um, you know, we, we felt a lot of pride about our advocacy around the contract in 2017. Uh, you know, the first time the city had ever voted down a contract. Uh, we saw substantial improvement uh, in the 2018 agreement that was subsequently reached. Um, and, and we continue to appreciate some of the things that uh, were agreed to in that. That said, uh, a fair number of the, some of the more significant gains were literally just overturned in this arbitration decision that Commissioner Weber just mentioned. And therefore, there isn't a lot of <laughs> satisfaction with the current agreement. In addition to the outstanding issues that were never addressed back in 2017, 2018, we've now reintroduced issues that we thought that we had fixed or at least help take step forwards on. So um, really quickly, some of our, you know, some of the top line things that we really point to as continuing issues. Uh, when we look at the promotion process, uh, this process, one, uh, which is uh, contained in Article 13 of the agreement, um, it uh, subscribes, it, it only includes uh, how officers perform on tests uh, administered uh, uh, through an agreed upon process their level of seniority, and any outside ed, uh, education achievement attained. Uh, it does not include uh, any consideration of, mis of a history of misconduct or brutality by an officer. Um, and so, um, you know, it is uh, solely at the discretion of the chief to use a process called promotional bypass uh, in order to take the people who score the highest on the test and say, no, they can't have it. Uh, we're going to move down that list. You ask the association and they'll say the chief does it all the time and it's totally political and they shouldn't do it. Uh, and from our perspective, um, we're not seeing it. <laughs> and we understand that, you know, um, that there, you know, a lot of the misconduct, the brutality that makes the news and that we hear about um, has gone through multiple chains of command, right? Individuals who saw it and didn't think enough of it uh, to do anything about it. And we can only assume that that's partly on the basis that, you know, they potentially acted in a similar fashion at previous levels of their employment. And that was not considered a factor and they were promoted anyway. Uh, so similarly, when we talk about hiring, particularly hiring existing officers, uh, people who are officers elsewhere, uh, there's nothing in the contract that stipulates that history of misconduct or brutality be considered in that process. Uh, and so we would like to see those things formally introduced into the metrics that determine whether or not someone who's already an officer either here or somewhere else can become an officer here or be promoted up the chain. Um, and this to us seems quite reasonable. Um, I think subsequently we look at uh, article 17, section four, access to records by officers. Officers who are subject to an investigation uh, get two full days uh, before, uh, with access to any and all complaints against them before they have to speak to an investigator. 
Um, and so we just compare this to the process that an individual might see uh, in a criminal context. Now, obviously, what we're talking about here is not a criminal context. It's purely, uh, uh, you know, suspensions, terminations that are, are what people can suffer. Um, but, you know, if if you are accused of something uh, and, and the police couldn't talk to you for two days and during that two days, you were given access to uh, the allegations against you. Uh, and really any other counter arguments I might want to make about, uh, you know, factual misstatements that you may have made. Um, and also you were given our eight hours of access to uh, all the video, video uh, and other things. Um, you know, <laughs> you could see how that uh, might limit the ability of uh, the courts, law enforcement, anyone to uh, to actually find you culpable for any sort of wrongdoing. So uh, to us, there needs to be some, uh, there's a lot of changes that need to happen there, uh, particularly just to prevent people from making up stories to fit the evidence that exists. Um, there's also so many restrictions on transparency within the agreement. Um, and this again stems from state law, uh, uh, we have a provision, Chapter 143 of the Local Government Code, particularly 089G, sets forth uh, confidentiality of personnel records. Uh, and again, this forms the floor, right? The floor is that everything that goes into an officer's personnel file is secret, cannot be shared. Um, and there are some things that the city and the association have agreed to, 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 to make public um, moving forward. Um, but on the whole, it's it's a it's a fraction of of, uh, of what is actually contained in these. Um, what we know is that in other places around the country, the state of Illinois, the state of California, uh, state of New York, uh, we're seeing uh, more of these files, more of these personnel records, particularly as it relates to misconduct, which is what we're concerned about. What are the allegations? What are the investigation materials about misconduct saying? Uh, we're seeing those become public. Uh, in, in, in large swaths. <laughs> and the world of, isn't falling down on policing. It isn't introducing a, a new, you know, issue of, you know, false allegations, destroying careers and things like that, uh, things that are often said to prevent that sort of transparency. And so we would love to see, um, you know, more information about particularly sustained uh, uh, issues of misconduct. Uh, uh, become public investigation materials, you know, all of the things that that happen um, should be accessible to the public. Again, these are public employees. Um, and and then a, just to finish up with a couple here, another really big one that we talked about a lot last time, which we made some strides on, but continues to be an issue from our understanding is the 180 day rule. So there's basically for any act, any misconduct that doesn't isn't deemed to rise to the level of a criminal complaint. Uh, there is basically a six month statute of limitations from the day of the incident so that an officer cannot be disciplined if an incident happened more than six months in the past. OK, so that means that the entire investigation uh, and the decision to, to do discipline has to occur within the 180 day window unless the chief says that uh, they just found out about it and then at which point they get another six months or the chief says this rises to the level of criminal activity. Uh, and therefore I get another six months. Uh, but what we understand is that, you know, we have police entirely control of the investigation process and these can take a while. Um, we know that <laughs> uh, these sort of proceedings don't necessarily happen really quickly. Um, and so we understand that officers don't want issues hanging over their heads for years at a time. Uh, I, I get that. Um, at the same time, there shouldn't be uh, such an arbitrary date at which uh, you know, someone cannot face discipline anymore for a truly harmful act, particularly when we know that sometimes people don't come forward uh, uh, for a period of time uh, because of their own fear or ignorance of the process or, or whatever it might be. And so we would love to see, um, you know, a, a additional ways to expand or extend this window to ensure that investigations have time to proceed properly and thoroughly and carefully. Uh, but then if, if harm is found to have been done, that there can still be ramifications for that. And there's no incentive to just slow roll an investigation, uh, for instance, to, to prevent any sort of accountability from, from occurring. Um, there's certainly some other things that I could go into, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop there. And obviously, you know, if there's any questions or, or comments, I'm happy to, happy to respond. 
And thanks again for the time. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Any questions for Mr. Harris? Commissioner Bernhardt, please go ahead. Yeah, we, we can't hear you, Commissioner Bernhardt. Commissioner Weber, if you can uh, go ahead. Yeah, so um, Chris, I was wondering, like, could you give us an example? And I was trying to think of one while you were talking, so I don't mean to put you on the spot, but of, a, of, a, of an issue that is gonna be discussed at the collective bargaining table where the union and the city of Austin, i.e., you know, the police department's management agree on something, but the citizens of Austin's interests aren't theirs. And I, I wonder if you could explain how, like, who's advocating for us at the table? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things, right? So, um, you know, the transparency one is a big one, right? Um, if there's substantial wrongdoing found, right, and 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 a discipline is is rendered in a case, uh, if that case corresponds with some sort of civil rights violation uh, to the person who's made the complaint, uh, the city will ultimately be held liable in that <laughs> in that right, and then the money uh, to pay uh, any any damages or judgments uh, to the defendant are going to come from the city. So it. It is very much not in the city's interest <laughs> always to, to see uh, some of these issues end up uh, in discipline uh, and definitely to end up in the news. Um, you know, I think other issues where we see um, uh, we see uh, the city try to avoid uh, uh, appeals and arbitration uh, and, and pay for the, the cost of it. Right. So. Um, it, it's expensive to hold an arbitration or appeals process if uh, an officer doesn't like a discipline that's rendered against them. And so the city will say, well, what we'll say is if you only get suspended three days, um, we'll let you make that a paid suspension if you promise not to appeal, right? Uh, we'll let you, uh, and that includes one to three day, and there's even uh, options for that up to 15 day suspensions. So. Uh, they'll say, you know, let's let's let the officer use their own vacation time, their own holiday time to pay themselves so that they're they're not actually harmed <laughs> uh, uh, in the process of this suspension, uh, except for losing those those days of vacation. I don't want to not mention that, but but ultimately they get paid while they're suspended. Uh, and the city's fine with that because officers agreed not to appeal. Uh, and the city doesn't want to go through the appeals process. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, in instances like this, and for topics like this, it is up to us uh, and up to communities uh, and, and community groups to, to you know, try to uh, raise these issues and, and make sure that people understand and that our council members understand uh, that it's important. Um, and, you know, I think it's the, the last thing I didn't mention with because it was covered in the in the in the conversation about the recent arbitration loss for the city about oversight is all the restrictions on the oversight offices, right? Um, and particularly on, on their ability to do any form of what's called investigating. Uh, you know, uh, they can't collect evidence of any kind. Uh, the people who are civilians who are not city staff that participate in the panel have <laughs> exorbitant restrictions on how long they have access to information. And of course, the recommendations they make, uh, you know, are important. That, but they don't have any actual impact on any the disciplinary decisions. So there's the whole Article 16, which is just a list of restrictions, basically, on any person who's not a sworn officer uh, to do anything about any form of misconduct uh, that might have been committed. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Um, we have about four more minutes. Um, I will open it up to any other questions of any of the speakers. Or if you have questions for Mr. Harris, we can keep on that as well. Go ahead, Commissioner Weber. Just for those watching at home, this very interesting discussion, how can people watch the bargaining? How can regular people learn what's going on at the bargaining table? 
Selena or Ken, do you guys know the answer to that? Or maybe Lee, maybe Lee can answer that. Or Mr. Crawford? I, I can. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, uh, they can watch it online, uh, just on the uh, ATXN. Uh, and there's other uh, websites that they can go to to watch it. Uh, I know I've watched some of uh, Selena's and EMS's. Uh, so uh, there are ways you can do it. Um, or, you know, they're more than welcome to come if they have time to show up and, and watch it. You know, Chris is very active in doing that and, and participating in the process. Uh, so if you want to just come and watch it in person, uh, it's probably like watching uh, uh, paint dry. But uh, <laughs> it, 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 it is... Uh, it's a long process, and, and but it is available on TV to watch. Um, we they said that they cannot use ATXN for our bargaining, and so we've been using um, a City of Austin YouTube page. Um, so it's not been showing on um, ATXN. It's only been showing on this YouTube page. Um, we determined um, at the beginning because of COVID that we would not allow people to come into the room. Um, and in the past two weeks, because of Omicron, we switched to virtual. And so everybody um, is, is in that YouTube page. Um, and I don't think probably for the rest of our bargaining that uh, we'll go back in person. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all for your participation. We appreciate it. And uh, thank you for the updates.